Right. Good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for coming today. Uh, today is a collaboration event with uh, Mac, and I've seen quite a few new faces. I'm assuming that's Mac audience. Um, so we're going to talk about SQL injection today, uh, and I hope it's uh, somewhat relevant to all those developers that comes from the uh, Mac audience as well. So um, how many of you actually use databases before in their programs? Anyone have experience with MySQL or anything? It's going to be a difficult workshop today then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so just to roughly explain, um, SQL is a programming language used for managing databases. And here I'm talking about, about relational databases. So those are those typical ones we talk about when we say Oracle databases or MySQL. Um, no SQL is not a relational database. Um, we're not going to talk about the SQL injection to, for no SQL today. Uh, it works fundamentally different. Um, but it uh, scales a program language to just kind of manage those databases. You update the records, you insert the records and all that. And the database itself, it's organized in these table forms. So you have a column and a row like this. And using SQL language, you can try. Uh, you can pick one element or an entire row or entire column if you want to. The common SQL queries uh, follow this format. So you select a column, and you do a from table, followed by the condition uh, with the where uh, by appending where before the query. For example, if you want to, if you want to write a query that requests the list of admins from the database, uh, you can say select the username, which is the column that you're selecting it from, from the users. So that's the entire table. That's the users table, and the uh, the condition here is row equals to admin, and that row is the column here, and that equals to admin. We are looking at the individual values here, and when they say admin. Uh, you uh, you filter this out, and the response is going to be Alice. Now, this response, um, for this one, it's a single value. It can be a, a multiple column um, table as well. Now, SQL injection um, lies, uh, the whole concept lies around manipulating this query from a user input um, to kind of um, do unintended, uh, to get access to unauthorized uh, value or data or just um, change the um, how it functions pretty much. Um, so consider you're logging into a website and this is fairly a common, fairly common way of constructing an SQL query for people who does hackathons and who wants to quickly script up something uh, for a login system. Um, so it, this is fairly common. Select ID from users where username is Bob and password is one two three four five six. You would often have in a website you can you often have a username and a password field that a user can input, and the input is going to be a Bob and password that is going to be appended into um, these into the query itself. Now in this query, the database will only return Bob because that's where it satisfies this condition where username equals to Bob and the password is equal to one, two, three, four, five, six. If you get one of those wrong, so if that password is wrong, it won't return anything. And it's kind of a really simple way of creating a login system in a website. So that's a lot of people, what people that's what people in hackathons do. And I used to do that as well. Now, what hackers are able to do is insert a malicious payload. And how would this payload look like? And one of the typical examples that we use is um, colon, not colon, sorry, um, apostrophe and dash dash. Now this is the language, uh, we're using MySQL as an example here, that dash dash, um, they represent comments in MySQL. And similar to um, if you know um, cross write scripting, um, they cannot distinguish between these characters, um, these um, characters that we provide. So uh, if an attacker were to, were to put a string, Bob apostrophe dash dash, it's going to render like this. And you will see that this part is grayed out. That means that part now behaves like a uh, comment. Now this one's like, um, yeah, that now, now that's a comment. 
And then now they're only evaluating select ID from users where username is Bob, and they're completely disregarding whatever you put into the password field. And that's kind of where the vulnerability comes in because now um, if a website um, you're using, uh, you're accepting input username and password, it doesn't matter if you get the password right or not. If you get the username correctly, uh, you would be able to log in to your website. And this is the type of code you would write to make it vulnerable. Um, so that user input, if you directly um, append, if you have a query string and if you directly append whatever that user inputs into a string and if you directly execute that query, that's where the, uh, the, the vulnerable, uh, vulnerability happens. So that's kind of an example code in Java. Now I am, oh, sorry, just one more slide. Um, there are two types, two main types of things you can do with SQL injections, and one of them is altering or subverting the application logic. So the thing I was talking about, um, being able to log into a website without providing the right password, that's an example of altering or just changing the application logic. Um, there's another one, which is probably more common, uh, is the retrieval of hidden or non-authorized data. I will get into that a little bit later. So this one's the example that I used earlier with the login. Now I'm going to demonstrate how um, it's, it works uh, in the login page. Um, there's a website called Port Swigger, this thing. Um, they provide websites, um, uh, sorry, this website provides the, uh, various labs for you to practice different uh, website vulnerabilities. I am going to just try this one. Uh, which um allow uh which kind of simulates this um scale inject uh SQL injection vulnerable website. What I have on the left here is a software called Burp Suite. Um, you can try to look into it, and after this, you're going to do a couple of challenges or labs, um, after the workshop. So um, if you want to download this, download it now. I guess, um, what this allows you to do for the purpose of this uh workshop, um, it's going to intercept the connection between our browser and their servers and allow you to see what data is being sent to the server. And the um, okay, so that's the website we're looking at and. What we're especially looking at is the login page. Here. Now, this is what I was talking about earlier about a typical login page. You have a username and the password field. And if you type random things in, of course, it's going to say invalid username or password. Um, it said in the challenge, you we know that uh, we know the user's name, uh, sorry, username here, uh, it's administrator. Um, but we cannot guess the password. You're still going to get this error. Now, the cool thing about this software is you can intercept uh, the connection. So if you do administrator and do whatever password in there, you're going to see that is way too small. Two very boring minutes later. Okay, I hope you see this. Um, here it says username equals administrator ampersand and password equals to this random character I just entered. And uh, it basically um, shows what data I just inputted. Now this is intercepted before it's sent to the server. Um, so what we can do is actually edit this data before it gets, uh, we can modify this uh, request. And the example, I'm going to use the same example I used earlier, which is an apostrophe and do dash dash after that. Uh, so what this does is it um, comments out everything after um, comparing the user. So it just disregards what a, what a password would want. It, would, it disregards the password input. So we can leave this as is. And what you would notice after I forward this, which is submitting this um, request to the server, is I was able to log in as administrator now without putting without having a knowledge of the password itself. Um, so that is a demonstration of a unauthorized login uh, using SQL injection. Now that one was uh, altering or subverting the application logic. And ne the next example I'm going to talk about is the retrieval of hidden or unauthorized data. Now there's a technique in uh, SQL. It's a basic um, function in SQL called union. 
uh, this keywords allows you to retrieve data from other tables in the database. So this is a generic example uh, that you can use. Assume you have two tables in your application. You have an employee table and a customer table in the same database. Now you can query both of these uh, using this syntax uh, saying that you select these uh, column name from a table and do a union select and the same column and from the other table. Now the requirement for this union uh, syntax to work is you need each of the queries to return the same number of columns. So if um, the customer table is only three, or if you're only selecting three columns here and four columns here, it wouldn't work. And also the data types in each column must be compatible. So if you have a string column and a integer column on the same column, oh, sorry, yeah, on the same column, that wouldn't work with unions. So if you execute this command, uh, it will return a table like that, just one set of table. Now, and when a hacker is attacking this website, you wouldn't really know what, how many columns you would have. And how do we know how many columns you, uh, the table or the query has? Well, it's just by guesswork, really. Um, so what you can do is do union select and null and doing that multiple times, you do no um, comma no just to try to brute force the number of columns. If the number of columns in the database is different from the one you input it, so the one you're trying to when, once you attempt, it will throw an error here, something like this. Um, it must match the same number of results of resulted columns. So. By keep doing this, keep, you keep doing this with uh until you don't get this error, and you get the uh, mysterious message or some nothing, but no error is a good thing. So if you don't get this error, it's uh you know how many columns you have. So in this case, um this will return this error. Um that two nulls will also return an error. But when you do three, you wouldn't see that it wouldn't return an error. It might return a weird value, but it wouldn't be an error. Um, so after that, what you can do is actually start querying the uh, column name and you would be able to get that value. Now here is the demo of that working. So there's another lab in Port Swigger called um, SQL Injection Union Attack. So I'm going to open this. Now, if you look at this website, um, it's kind of half detective work to see what's going on in the website. Um, so you can see here, um, it's a clothing shop, I think. And there's a refine your search. And that's also a common thing you would do in a web application, uh, creating a filter for something. And you can often do that with SQL queries. Um, we can actually um, try to abuse this and try to get information beyond um, this category thing. Um, so again, I'm going to turn the intercept on and click here and see what's going on in the background. Um, I cannot see anything. <laughs> um, it says here, filter, uh, question mark, category, clothing, and shoes and accessories. And uh, we're just going to assume that this is the query that they're using. Uh, to filter the input. And what we are able to do, and first thing that we need to do in these uh, union attacks is to figure out the column number of columns that we have. Um, and I uh, just shown you how to do that. So that is going to be something like, um, question uh, union. I know it's small Akbar. <laughs> <laughs> now, what I typed in is column plus union select null. And that's the first example that I'm going to use. Just select, uh, just have one column and test if that works. If you do forward on this, you're going to see or rather nothing.
Let me try that again. The next morning. Okay, cool. So it's actually in the uh, web URL as well. So you can see what I did here. Um, select union still null. Uh, select null. Um, that returns internal server error, which uh, we're going to assume that it means that's not the correct number of columns. Um, so we're going to try a different number of this um, query until it works. And I'm going to jump straight into the answer because we don't want to waste time here. So what I did is there, um, put two nulls in there. And now we can say it didn't error out. And here we can safely, not safely, but we can kind of assume that we managed to get something to pass in there without causing any syntax error or anything like that. And after this, uh, we know that there's two columns that we can query from. And the step after this is find, finding which uh, column contains a vulnerable things that we can hack into. So one thing you can do is try to see which one may contain a string, which might be a use for uh, information for us. And for to do that, um, instead of using null, uh, we do a query with the uh, type that we want to get. So in this case, we want to uh, get a string. So we just put um, comma, oh, sorry, apostrophe ASD to just to have any strings. And as I said uh, earlier, um, union wouldn't work if you're trying to query a column that is in a different type. So by doing this, you can do it by error. You can find it by error, uh, which column may contain a string or not. You can actually see you, uh, I actually returned um, the string there uh, when I did it in the first column, uh, which basically means that I'm actually, uh, the first column may be the place where the, um, the string, the first column is where the string values are. And after that, uh, we can um, we can do a bunch of detective work and try to figure out what columns what. Uh, we can try to extend this and do try to see what type of um, data type is on the other columns by doing without using null for both of them. If you do this, um, both of them apparently passed. So yeah. I'm keeping nailing it every time. So this is a valid input. So the string, the first two columns is also a string as well. Uh, for the sake of demonstration, we're just going to assume that those columns are called username and password. And what we can do from that is actually try to get that um, data from uh, the website. So I'm doing the same thing that I did in the slides, which is doing a union select and selecting the columns that you want to get the data from and trying to construct a query. Um, now it's in the URL. And we know from the um, description of this, uh, we know the table is called users and the columns are called username and password. Um, cool. So I constructed, I, su I successfully constructed a payload here to uh, print out the table of the different table called users uh, using a union attack like this. So cool. Okay, that's a demonstration of that. Now there are different other different types of um, SQLi that you can do. One of them is error-based SQLi. It's similar to what I demonstrated earlier. Um, sometimes the error message can tell us about how the um, website is filtering the input. Um, so we can kind of deduce um, what's going on in the background and try to 
guess what query they're using to kind of uh, to craft the pay uh, to make it easier for us to craft the payload. Another type of um, uh, attacks that we can do is called inferential SQLI, uh, also known as bind SQLI. Um, this type of attack um, actually doesn't show these, um, it doesn't contain a result of our query and our HTTP response um, or the detail of the errors. Um, so it makes it a little bit harder to do SQLI injection, but even then we have a couple different ways to attack them. Uh, one of them blind error-based SQLI. Even with these generic errors, we can kind of tell um, what kind of vulnerabilities might lie uh, beneath that. Um, there's a program called SQL Map, uh, which is kind of an automation tool uh, to do this SQLI injection things, and they can kind of help uh, these these um, error-based SQLIs. They can help uh, with SQL Map to find the hints. Uh, Boolean-based SQLI. Um, there's some website that returns just true or false on the queries. Uh, one at the bottom is exactly that. Um, we're just saying, is the substring, the first substring of the version, is that number five? And, and when it returns true, I mean, that means true. And uh, keep, uh, keep iterating through these kind of queries and you can try to construct a meaningful uh, data out of that. That's kind of the Boolean based SQLI as well. Uh, and there's also time-based SQLI. Um, you're looking at the time it takes for the web server to respond to your query. And you can infer from that waiting time um, how uh, if your query is successful or not. Now, to all the developers here, um, there's different ways you can prevent SQLI. Uh, the primary defenses, and this is in the OWASP, uh, cheat sheet OWASP is a huge database of these vulnerability type of things. Uh, there are four main approaches. Uh, you just need to do one of uh, each, uh, one of them out of these four. Uh, the most preferred way to prevent against um, SQLI is using pre uh, prepared statement. Um, so this is the function I showed earlier uh, where it's vulnerable. Uh, it's just appending uh, whatever you get from the user at the end of the string. The way you uh, defend against that is using prepare statement. So if you look at uh, this new code now, uh, you can see there's a question mark here and you're using a prepared sh uh, statement uh, function. There are almost every programming language, every driver for these databases and these languages, they have they will probably have this uh, feature in, uh, in there. Uh, what this prepare statement does is you define the placeholder for the query string. And then after that, uh, you append, uh, you put your input inside that. And what this uh, does is the query will now actually literally try to match the string that you inputted. Uh, instead of um, interpreting it as a comment, for example, the dash dashes. So if you were to put um, that kind of thing, it will literally um, try to match the included special characters uh, with the uh, value in the database. Um, there's a different way called a stored procedure. And this is for people um, who wants to store the SQL code inside the database itself. Uh, this for developers, um, it has some efficiency uh, benefits if you do a stored uh, SQL queries. Now, the way to protect this is similar to the parameterized um, approach. So it's the same thing. You put uh, the question mark there kind of as a placeholder uh, where you put the input and you fill that in later. So this query, again, it's dynamic, but it's also stored at the, uh, in the database as well. So it has some performance benefits if you uh, do it in a storage procedure manner. There's also a little bit easier or easier way of doing this. Um, it's called allow list input validation. And this can be as simple as just having a set of strings that you're comparing against. Um, maybe you have a set of values that you want to accept from the users and nothing more. Maybe it's a drop down. Um, you can have a case statement, say uh, if the value is this, table name is that, and you use this table name, um, the one you defined uh, to put into the SQL uh, queries so that it's not a you, the users don't get to directly interact uh, with the SQL query. 
And the last one is escaping all the user's supplied input. And this is not the preferred way of preventing against SQL injection just because it's just error prone. Um, so if only use this if the previous uh, method doesn't work, but, and it's also database specific. So if you have a MySQL uh, database and Oracle SQL database living together, you have to do this um, escaping characters for each of those databases you're using. But um, there is a thing called database encoders that they are building. They have an enterprise security API. Uh, what they provide is sets of rules to kind of parse your string input and sanitize it as much as possible to be, be safely used in a SQL query. So that's one of the uh, least preferred method of preventing against SQL attacks. Um, there's also additional defense that you can do. Um, the one I mentioned before about union attacks, um, be able to access the other table in the database. To prevent against that, you can use this least privilege um, kind of idea. So you don't give the user that's accessing the uh, databases the admin access. And so giving access to all the tables in your database. Uh, you can use multiple database users for each function. So maybe a login system has a different privilege than a shopping cart or those product filtering ones. And that includes read and write access. Maybe some of the database ones only, only needs a read access or once if it needs write access, just provide it on the users that only needs them. And there's also another uh, feature called um, SKO views. Uh, what this can do is actually limit the read access to specific, uh, down to specific fields uh, within tables or joins of tables. Uh, so you, what you can do is you just create this view that outputs a hash. One of the examples is you can create a view that outputs the hash of the password field and not the value in the field itself. So that's kind of the rough introduction to SQL injection. Um, we want you guys to try it yourself. So here are a couple of challenges that you may go through after this. Um, visit this website here and try to go ahead with these challenges and ask the committees or any of us to help with any challenges you face during this lab. Thank you.